On this week's Entrepreneurial Edge, we're in Dubai for the story of Harry Gandhi, the man who lost his job and decided to set up a company with £10,000 and three people. It was a journey of steel and nerve, with the odd helping of humble pie. We're here in Dubai with Harry Gandhi, the man who founded the unique group here more than a quarter of a century ago. It's been quite a journey. Um, just uh, tell us about those, those humble beginnings when you first founded this company. Yeah, the humble beginning started because I lost my job. I was working with someone, lost my job. Uh, decided to approach the chairman of the company and stated that I could make this work. Uh, I know how to do this. I just need his backing. And uh, he, he took my word. He, I made a small business sketch for him. And he took my word and he, he said, OK. Uh, and he put his house up for me to, and his name is Richard Aldridge, so I should mention him. Uh, uh, he put his house up to get us 10,000 pounds on those days from Barclays Bank and get us going. So we started with three people here in, in Middle East, in Dubai, and went on to become today what we are, you know, 500 people company globally. And in those days, a sketch literally was... A sketch was paper. just a pen and a paper and, <laughs> you know, just write a few things and say, we can do this business and we can do that. Well, I know both of us were a lot younger then. Were, were you worried at the time? Uh, of course, you, you're always worried when you start something. But I think I had the confidence that I, I could make it work because I'd seen the market and I could assess the market a bit sharper than anybody else. So I thought there is definite, there is definite a play here. We can make some money. And how long did it take you from that first day in the office to your first contract? Uh, it took us about, uh, about a month uh, to, to prepare ourselves, get some technical assistance and stuff of engineering, uh, get some assets, because we are core basically a rental company, so we had to get some assets to rent. But we, it took us about 30 to 40 days to get going, which is very small humbling. I still have my book which shows me I rented the first Hewlett Packard 9825 little computer uh, at, at something like $5 a day to someone. <laughs> but, yeah, I still have that book and it shows me where we started really. Because yeah. this is it, I mean, if people look at you now and you've got a large global concern, but they forget that, that, that early pain that you went through. I mean, uh, just give us a yeah, little the, the, You know, I used to drive to Abu Dhabi. In those days, the, the, the roads were not so good. The camels would pass. And I used to drive to Abu Dhabi to rent something, to deliver something to somebody for $10, $15, you know, two, three hours drive, to go there, see the man, hand it over, come back. All by ourselves, we stop by on the roadside, have a biryani, and come back, and that's that's the whole day gone. You know, you just do that. And that was uh, 26 years ago when you started. Yeah. Um, and uh, when did you start thinking? Or how did you build this business slowly? Um, when did you start thinking you really got something? Uh, I, I, during the first year, we found out that the customer wanted innovative solutions. They wanted to run their projects uh, effectively and they were looking for solutions from people. And we really latched on to that. So we actually started looking and asking customers which sectors they thought there was no local service. And that has been the core of Unique, is to provide a global solution but locally. So that's how we learned. We asked, uh, we talked to them, we made relationships and said, which area of your business needs assistance that, that you can't get it locally and you have to go overseas to get it or whatever. And that, that's how they guided us. And our partnership with our customers are core to our growth. And, and you're specialized in the past in um, the gas and uh, fuel exploration industry, helping supplying equipment for that. Just give us a quick sketch of, of what you do. Basically, we are specialists in subsea equipment industry. So it, it is related to oil and gas, but it's not limited to that. So we, we work in oil and gas industry, environmental industry, uh, wind energy, and related stuff. So we are subsea equipment providers for that. So we manufacture uh, and supply and rent uh, equipment to subsea industries. So basically EPC contractors and, and, and likes of them. They are all our customers. Just talk us through how, how the company grew, because a lot of companies try to grow too quickly. A lot of companies uh, sometimes run into trouble because of that. How did you deal with that? We basically grew out of Middle East, uh, uh, strength, strength of ours being customer, 
guiding us to what they wanted. And we slowly went through a process of bank finance, personal investment. We never took money out of the business. We reinvested everything we made in the business. And we grew over a period of time within Middle East and then, of course, globally now. Uh, we took our uh, opportunities as they came by. And that is key to any entrepreneur, how, you, how opportunistic you are and how quickly you can uh, get your company to be able to find finance and find uh, uh, manpower, uh, human manpower resources that, that become part of you and help you grow. So we grew uh, in bit by bit. Uh, we, we started the first year, probably I don't remember my numbers, but it was about a million pounds a year. Uh, we grew to grew to five million in five years. Then we go to fifty million in you know ten years, and that's how we have become what we are today. So we have five hundred people worldwide, but we started with three in Dubai. Was there one uh, particular opportunity in in the years of growth that you would say was golden? Uh, yes, very particularly we remember one. Uh, and, and uh, I don't know how much you know about subsea industry, but it was about uh, a big plow underwater. And one of our customers was actually starting a huge job in India with it and needed a lot of sensors on it. And uh, really, it was a turning point in our, in our company, unique at the, in those days, because we got to supply uh, the full sensor package, which was more than we ever imagined. It was about a million dollar contract for us, and that was like huge contract in those days. And, and we got to supply a number of times because they had hit some issues in, in the environment in India, and they kept losing sensors. And that was a golden opportunity for us because they were insured and we kept supplying equipment. And that, that contract was the turning point for Unique. Uh, we really made uh, immense amount of, of of goodwill from the client because we never asked when they lost something we always were there helping them to do technology and and then they paid us everything that was due for it so our view was that he's in trouble we help him and we will see what what later can happen commercially and and th both parties won in that base so we, we re I really remember that contract that was the turning point yeah. and uh, what did that uh, allow your company to do that that security of that uh, contract how did, how did you well that that helped us really to to become a preferred supplier to very harsh environment uh, when 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 companies the reputation came with it when companies were doing large contracts they knew they can rely on unique to supply technology to supply service and to supply customer support without uh, trying to negotiate contracts when when they are doing a job and that 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 reputation carries us through even today and what about some of the the bad times, the, the tough times. Were there ever times when you thought, well, this is it, I've had it? Well, that happens a number of times, you know, we have done it. But I think in, in, in recent past, it's become more apparent that the business has become very difficult. Uh, however, initially, uh, during the growth period, we, we never really felt that. We always thought we'll survive because we were always very conservative company. So we never really extended ourselves. We, we didn't take too much bank debt. Uh, we really reinvested all of ourselves, so we were never really worried about that. Of course, you have to, in business, you have to manage your people and the cost, but we were happy to say, happy to say that in 25, 30 years, we never really faced that. But in recent times, it's becoming very critical now. Well, there's been a lot of up and downs uh, in, in business, especially here. Um, what, what has been the, the challenges? The challenges has been uh, really the, the customers expectation of, of pricing and how you manage uh, your cost around it. That is the biggest challenge. In, in a, and, and that's true for any businesses. You know, how much actually you can, you, you, you can create a margin out of a business. And over the years, the competition and, and, and also over the years, uh, the expectation of the customers to get very cost-effective solutions has become very difficult for for each entrepreneur and whoever is in the business. So you have to manage your costs. And, and of course, the HR challenges are always there because you have built yourself into a global brand and people expect to come to work to you with, with certain amount of expectations. So. And what about the, the world economy right now? There's a lot of uh, doomsayers out there saying it's going to be even more rough in the years to come. How are you seeing it? 
uh, I, I see it the same way. Uh, I see it. Uh, there are more challenges coming. I think all companies, every company will have to innovate themselves. I don't think you can work on a basic pass model. Uh, you really have to innovate yourself because the economy is very challenging. And not only just in oil and gas and subsea. In oil and gas and subsea, there is a little bit of turnaround because we have faced it for the last three, four years. But uh, in all other industries, we, I see it uh, through when I talk to my friends and my business colleagues, they're all finding it extremely challenging, especially in Middle East. And, and I'm sure worldwide, uh, we haven't heard anything different from Netherlands or from South Africa or anywhere else. We, we have found that everybody's being challenged, but challenged through margins and challenged through cost structures. Just lastly, before we go to the break, I mean, your business has obviously been transformed like everyone else's by technology. Um, do you see uh, a lot more changes coming? I see huge changes coming in technology. I, I think the whole, our industry itself, the, uh, everything needs to be rethinked and rethought uh, because there are technology of drones, technology of subsea equipment that can be used without all the traditional equipment that we have been using for so long. And it is, it, the, the growth the growth path is just through a technology now. You really cannot uh, work with the old business model or old equipment anymore. You have to renovate. You have to show show cost effectiveness. You have to show the client how he can save on uh, save on his project, and that's where the technology is playing a huge part. Uh, and and basic the robotics and the uh, for us in our industry the robotics and the and the drones are taking over really in time to come. It is coming, but in five, seven years, it will be only that and nothing else. So you think that there's going to come a time when you'll have people here sitting on shore? And, and just, yeah, they're already time. They're, they're, they're running ships by its own. Uh, in Norway, they already started that. Uh, one of our very, very uh, supplier partner with us is already doing that. The supply is controlling from Norway. The other day, I was attending a subsea ocean conference, and there was a presentation from another company that you can do pipeline inspection, but the guys will be sitting somewhere in Europe and running running the robots uh, down there without any requirement of, you know, through 4G and networks and 5G, they'll be able to run and you don't need to be there. You don't need to be there. We're in Dubai to speak to an entrepreneur and founder of the unique group here, Harry Gandhi. Thank you very much for joining us again. Um, now, you've made several forays into Africa and you're likely to make more, but uh, just, just tell me that the first uh, operation you set up with, again, it was a bit like it mirrored the company here in the fact it was in Cape Town, it was a small business, you started with a handful of people, now it's grown up. How did you spot that opportunity? Uh, you know, in, when you travel and meet a lot of people, you come across uh, a lot of people from various countries. And I met uh, my then partner in, in, in South Africa, who was running a very small company, leading it with technology. So we were very impressed by the equipment he was manufacturing there. And we thought it, 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 it had opportunity to be globalized, the little small uh, South African uh, technology-led manufacturing business. So we started chatting, uh, uh, we, we worked with them for a year and a half as a supplier-customer relationship. Uh, we then decided that uh, it is with, with mutual understanding that it would be best if we branded it uh, as a global uh, company like Unique. And uh, we then approached them that if would, they would come into Unique. So uh, we basically merged with them. and, and even though they were much smaller than us, we offered them shares at unique group level, and, and we, we merged with them. So we therefore start, started this relationship, which has now led the South African company to, to manufacture for us globally, uh, and, and we distribute their products globally out of South Africa. Uh, it was a smallish company, 30, 35 people. Uh, we have turned it into now 120 people out there, and uh, uh, Unique Group's most major uh, contracts in diving equipment uh, is being led through South Africa. And uh, the technology is there. So what's being made in Cape Town? Yeah. Where is it ending up around the world? Just give uh, an example. It's, it's ending up everywhere. It's ended up in UAE, it's ended up in Singapore, China, in America. 
so we are selling it in um, something like 30 different countries worldwide, what is being manufactured in South Africa. And how is this an example, you think, of the so-called South-South cooperation? We have emerging markets in the Southern Hemisphere sort of helping each other out with uh, capital. That's correct. Uh, the, the, the South African market uh, has got a lot of design and technology, the, the local entrepreneurs there, and, uh, and there is a lot of service available that can be globalized. So I think through the co cooperation with, with, with you know, more mature markets, uh, we can actually uh, see a lot of opportunities for South African economy. These are very difficult times, as you probably know, um, in the South African economy. Uh, there's still a lot of call for reform. There's no doubt at all that the economy is struggling. How do you see it as a foreign investor? As a foreign investor, we see that the, the, there is strength in human resources in South Africa. There's strength in, in ability to design and build stuff very cost effectively. I think the challenges come from capital markets, availability of, of, of reasonably you know, effective, cost-effective finances. It comes from HR policies or labor laws out, out in South Africa. I think the challenges are coming out of that. Challenges are how they can reform themselves so that people can invest more into the country, bring more foreign direct investment, give them uh, ability to change because uh, any dynamic uh, uh, company needs to be able to change, lower their uh, labor resources up and down as the as the economy of the world drives it. So I think that is extremely important that that uh, South Africa changes itself towards that. I mean, as a foreign investor, what sort of reforms and changes would you like to see in the South African economy? I, I would like to see really the biggest change I'd like to see is in labor laws. I think ability to uh, to to work around and work with the people and and be able to create large work resources when required and, and when not required. I think that, that is the major change I'd like to see. And uh, also, not only uh, South Africa, you've also recently gone to a joint venture in Port Harcourt in Nigeria, um, maritime training industry. How was, how was that uh, to set up? I mean, was, was it a lot of bureaucracy? Was it a lot of time? How was it? Well, it actually originated out of our Cape Town office. What happened was we had set up a most advanced dynamic positioning uh, maritime training center in Cape Town. However, the, the visa and the labor regulations didn't allow a lot of uh, African uh, uh, students to come and study in Cape Town because the amount of time it took for them to get a particular you know, entry into the country and go out. Uh, so, th therefore, the, the thought process started that where is the biggest market, where is the biggest market for this, for dynamic training. And, and we, we therefore decided to move it to, to Nigeria because that's where most of the students were coming from. And uh, we decided that uh, we'll find a joint venture. So we met Mr. Chakin and, and he had already running a, a running maritime training center. So we, we actually invested in the training center with our equipment and actually made it a larger, so now we have about 100 students coming through every year. Interestingly enough, uh, you've got two of the largest economies there in Africa we've just been talking about. How did you find the welcome for foreign investors in Nigeria when you approached them? I think uh, for our industry, for in particular to bring technology and service in oil and gas is very welcome in, in Nigeria especially, because in Nigeria uh, there has always been a lack of localization. And our unique group's uh, vision and, and thought process always has been global technology but with localization. And I think we've been very much welcome in, South, uh, in Nigeria. Same in South Africa, we've been very much welcome. Our partners have really helped us. And we, we really see opportunities for, for export out of South Africa more than oil and gas because our industry is oil and gas. There's not much oil and gas in South Africa, though there is mining industries and all that. But we've been able to see the opportunity of export, opportunity of how we can utilize the, the strength of South Africa, which is the technology that they have with them. Um, Nigeria, now the, the largest economy by GDP on the continent. How, how do you see, uh, I know it's had its problems in the last few years, how, how do you see the economy shaping up there? I think uh, we have seen some trend over the last year and a half that is changing again, especially in oil, oil and gas and subsea market. Uh, since the 
oil prices have stabilized. Uh, we have found that there is reinvestment coming back into Nigeria. And uh, there is a lot of approach from the government to localize the Nigerian economy. So I think any foreign company that is investing there and becoming local uh, can see a lot of opportunity in Nigeria. I think it's coming together in Nigeria towards that path, especially in oil and gas industry. I'm not so ever in known about the other industries, but in oil and gas industry. Certainly. So you do see um, uh, slightly brighter times ahead, you think? Yeah. yeah, definitely. We see the times are getting better out in West Africa and South Africa. Yeah. And also in Nigeria, again, one of the problems that they've suffered is this, this issue of getting currency outside the country. Yeah. How you dealt with that? Vol vol volatility of currency is always very difficult in Nigeria, also in South Africa. We, we basically have partnered with our Nigerian partners. So we, we really are not looking so much to get, get you know, if you if you finally pay proper taxes and all, you can get something out. But we are only at a starting point there, so it's only 18 months there. So we are looking to grow then, and most of the contracts are driven by oil companies who can pay internationally. So therefore, we don't face that challenge so much as unique group. Where else are you looking in Africa? We are looking at Gabon. Uh, I've made a trip to Gabon with my son. Uh, uh, we have been there, we looked at Gabon, we looked at Ghana. So we are looking at opportunities around that area, yeah. And uh, a bit closer to home here also, I mean, there's the Expo coming here next year. What is that like to mean for companies like yourself who've got connections here in Dubai? Uh, our, our partners will be exhibiting. Uh, there should be a lot of B2B opportunities out of Expo 2020. We feel that a lot of uh, local companies can expose their their ability to do business to the world and and we hopefully have a lot of visitors who would be able to visit our own facilities as well when they are visiting expo 2020 so i think it will give give the dubai brand or uae brand and unique uh, can benefit from that brand. and we're talking about visitors in the millions extra yeah, next year right. will yeah. be so there we expect a lot of visitors and they're going to be around for six months so there's a lot of opportunity to do B2B, B2B business, really. And speaking about business, your own business, uh, it's been more than a quarter of a century since you started now. What do you, how do you approach this idea of like legacy and succession? We have built a strong team of uh, uh, manpower, uh, managers and people. I have my son coming in, uh, who is second generation. Uh, he's now re risen to being chief operating officer of the company. Uh, so I'm, and, and only thing I teach him is not to build a business to sell after two years, build the business for to last another 25 years. And I believe he has the ability. And these young people, you know, this they they learn a lot more than us. So they are quicker than me. And and they, the whole young team that we have created at Unique is really picking up the the next step of the company to move into more technology, to move into. Uh, more R and D to move, to get the company to build its own IP and strength. So I'm I'm pretty hopeful that that the team we have created led by by uh, Sahel, my son, will will make a change uh, to Uni. When you're sitting down mentoring him for the future, I mean, what sort of things do you tell him? The fruit of your quarter of a century in this game. Uh, the only thing I tell him is try not to be. Uh, too super aggressive, try to be conservative, but build for a long term and take care of your people. And that's the main thing I pass on to him, so take care of, of the, the people around you. Make a team that, that, that works with you and is part of this growth with you. And that's the only thing I tell him, yeah. And yourself, um, you're a cricketer and you're... Um, Ex-cricketer. Ex-cricketer, well, we both are. And, um, <laughs> And you're a golfer as well. What, what inspires you uh, away from business? Uh, just just reading at my free time, uh, uh, playing golf with my family, my wife. You know, she's been supportive throughout this whole uh, uh, you know journey of of working hard and not being home and all that. So it gives gives us both time on the course together, three four hours. You know, you don't get those time away from work. So all that put together inspires me to play golf a lot more. Uh, with the friends that you know we don't outside the business is very important to stay in touch. Uh, it helps us and travel. You know this this things keeps me going. And who in, who inspires you, uh, particularly in business? I mean, who do you do you uh, take inspiration from? From Richard Branson. 
Jim Branson. He's, 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 he's a great inspirer to me. I think he, he brings out a complete different approach to everything in life. And I think uh, he's one guy who really he shows the world that you, you can take on any challenge and actually you can, you can do it. Uh, and that, that really is, you know, he looks at everything in a different manner. And in my early days, I, I came across his marketing manager, John Calcutt, and uh, he introduced me. And uh, I really think that he's one guy that people can look forward to learn from, yeah. And there's a guy who started with virtually nothing when he was a teenager, left school. Yeah. But he looked at every problem in a different manner, right? He, he said, why can't I own an airline? You know, I can. <laughs> if I want to, I can. And he did it. So, you know, that's what inspires me. But it's interesting, though, in this, in this day and age, if, if a young 16, 17-year-old came up and said, listen, I want to have a, a worldwide business, etc., people perhaps would look at him sideways in this day and age. I don't know. What do you think? Well, I think uh, if somebody came up to me, I'd say, yeah, you can. You can probably own and run a global business. You just have to have the tenacity. The problem these days, especially with private equities and capital market and all that, every young entrepreneur that I see wants to build a business and sell mm. and, and then have a holiday somewhere. And I keep telling everyone I meet that, you know, you can't build a business to sell. You have to build a business to survive for 30, 50 years. Then you can get an opportunity to sell. And, and I think that is the biggest change I see in these young entrepreneurs is, is they're all in it to just try to make a good business in two, three years and, and find a buyer. And, uh, you know, that was never my objective and never will be. But end of the day, I think this is what I feel that we can teach the young entrepreneurs to build business that lasts long term. Leave some legacy, you know, you go away. There are 500 people, their families being fed. Uh, you know, 200 people in Africa, and, and that, that makes a difference to the world. You've got to have the local CSR going with you. you know? Isn't it a problem with the young generation that they want things quickly, they want things now, they're not going to say 5, 10, 15 years. Do you find that? It is always the difficulty. You have to coach them. You have to make them learn. You have to, they will fail if they, if they keep that, that approach to life. So I think you have to coach them. And as, as mentors and elders of the business, we have, to, we have to teach them that. And lastly, we're talking about legacy, years to come. When people mention the name Harry Gandhi, what do you want them to think? They want to think that uh, I, I feel that they, they, they must associate with me with my company. And, and my CSR efforts, you know, I want to be socially responsible. I want to be known as I've done everything possible uh, for my, initially for my unique family, my own family, and then thereafter the whole social world family. So uh, I feel that if I do enough for them, which, you know, with all the resources that God has given me, <laughs> uh, I do enough and uh, we get involved with a lot of charities. and. And hopefully that, that they will remember us, uh, you know, that we, we created something for them and, and left them to run it, I guess. That's the main thing. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed. That's Harry Gandhi, entrepreneur, Dubai-based, the man who built the unique group in just over a quarter of a century on his business, life and times. That's all we've got time for. And for me, Chris Bishop in Dubai, it's goodbye. <laughs> Oh,